when reading and researching the different cultures and the different um, groups of human beings throughout the world, something that seems to be a constant theme that you can find across times, across space, uh, across continents, is the thought and the desire that seems to arise within the human heart to literally live forever. This seems to be something that, that humans, to some degree or another, are somehow wired and designed for. Even before Christianity was on the scene, many times religions would talk about some sort of capacity or some sort of life after death. You'll see this pop up, too, in various quests and stories. You think about even how many times do we hear about these ancient stories of discovering the fountain of life, you know, the fountain of youth, this idea of wanting to, to live forever. Humans uh, are perpetually seemingly on this quest, and, and it depends on its time and its day and its age and the other circumstances around it, but it expresses itself sometimes a little bit differently, but it's still there. Even, for example, in a generally, say, an atheistic society, there's still this idea of, like, I can cling to my youth, because this youthfulness kind of exudes life. You think about even today how much energy and, and money and resources are spent on, on just even the concept of health, you know, and I want to maintain this. Why? Well, I want to extend my life. I want, you know, imagine how much marketing goes into it's kind of in a veiled way, but how much marketing even goes into almost this promise, at least at, until you cross 40, then you kind of go, yeah, all right, I give up. Uh, you know, but, there's, but there's so much marketing that seems to happen to, to give this, and, and it's all playing upon, it's all tapping into this, this concept of really living forever. And even when you go out, how many times do you hear at, at funerals, even ones that are, that are not religious funerals, though, there's this assumption that our loved one is, is in a better place, is still existing, when scientifically there doesn't seem to be evidence for that, but yet something inside the human person is wired for this living forever. In the Bread of Life discourse, this John chapter 6 that we've been reading about, Jesus as well is speaking to that longing, that, that desire that has been written into our existence. Because the fact is, this isn't an accidental idea. This is really something that God designed us for. We as humans have been designed to live forever. But there's a way that it does need to come about. And we have that really emphasized in the gospel today. So if you recall, just to rewind briefly on this Bread of Life discourse, in case you had fallen asleep last week or the week before, um, in, in John chapter 6, just before Jesus had done the feeding of the 5,000, you know, the people had this dinner, and they were very excited. They, they, and they remember if you, there was an abundance. There was so much left over that they had wicker baskets full of fragments. And so these people then... Then Jesus leaves, he goes across the sea, they wake up, they see he's gone, and they're like, well, let's go after him. Why? Well, they want breakfast. <laughs> you know? They're like, well, he gave us dinner, he can also give us breakfast. So they, they all go charging over there, and Jesus, seeing them coming, begins now to move. He, he gave them a physical taste, but now he's going to use that experience, the feeding of their bellies, for something more. And he begins slowly to allude to this bread that will last forever. And they get kind of excited, like, oh, okay, well, why don't you share it with us? And then he makes this amazing turn, and he says, I am the bread. And if you recall, last week, too, they, the, they, they hear him start talking about this, and they begin to murmur. You know, they begin to murmur about themselves, and they kind of, ooh. And so Jesus, though, starts driving this point home even harder. He hears them murmuring, but he doesn't adjust his explanation. He doesn't soften it. He doesn't say, oh, whoa, 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 I, I, I meant that a little bit uh, symbolically. Instead, he doubles down, and that's kind of where we start picking up in today's continuation of that. 
He says to the crowds, I am the living bread that has come down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And now as John is recalling this, notice how it's now elevated amongst the Jews. Last week, last time, they were murmuring. Now it says the Jews quarreled now. These words he's saying are starting to really stir something up inside of them. They're really starting to pressure them. And so they quarrel among themselves saying, okay, how how can this guy do this? What's he talking about here? And again, Jesus, not backing down from this concept, says, amen, amen, I say to you. Now think about what what he's saying. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has, and here's the catch, eternal life. Eternal life. In this brief moment, what Jesus is speaking to is really that deep longing that's been written on the soul of each and every human being this offer of eternal life. And he says that it is going to be my very self that gives you eternal life. Now, naturally, and I, I, I'll, I'll give some, you know, some uh, credit to the Jews that this is a hard saying. You know, they're gonna, they, that would be a very hard thing if that's the first time that I'm hearing this. But think of it in this way, of how we can see almost an analogy of life coming from this, in even our scientific world. Because you think about all that falls under the category of life, even scientifically, literally depends, its existence, its living, literally depends on something beyond itself. For example, take take the plants. If, If the sun and the nutrients in the soil, which are inanimate, which are not alive, But imagine if they could speak to the plants, to the grass, to the trees, and say, unless you consume me, plants, you are not going to live. (laughs) You must consume me to live. And so, by nature, they do, and as a matter of fact, the trees flourish. And when it's really good and they consume enough of it, they even produce fruits, and they become something of what we even look at, and we go, that's a really good tree, an apple tree that's there. And especially it's got to be Honeycrisp apples because, you know, U of M and those, you know, it's got to produce those really good, actually, hot take, sweet tango, even better than Honeycrisp. But, all right, (laughs) I'll see if Father Jake can put a poll up on the the website, (laughs) we can see. But but going back to it, though, but that, to be that good tree, to be alive, it literally must consume something outside of itself. If it doesn't, it will wither and it will die. But then, too, imagine if those plants could talk to the animals of the world. And they would say to those animals, unless you eat me, you do not have life within you. And so they consume that. And then if the animals and the plants could talk to us as humans physically, they would say to us, unless you eat me, you will not have life. Now, that's in the natural order. But we as humans, go back to the book of Genesis, have something more than only the natural order. Remember when God made us, God made the plants and the animals, the sun, the moon, the stars, all those things, he made them, and they were beautiful. But then he uniquely makes you and me. He makes humans. And as the book of Genesis, in that beautiful, mysterious, and attractive line says, and God made humans in his image and his likeness. That very mysterious line in there is the one unique thing that you and I have that the plants, the animals, and everything else does not have, made in the image and likeness. And one of the things that that means is that you and I also have the gift of a soul that's made to live forever. And just as in our physical world we need something outside of ourselves 
to live, so too our soul needs something. Our soul needs that bread of life. Our soul nourished is nourished off of that bread that comes down from heaven. And that's why Jesus Christ says, I give you this so that you may have eternal life. And this is really just the, the, the beauty of, of what this is as he's saying this, is that in this beautiful moment, it becomes our way of remaining with him. Because he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him remain. I was looking at that word, and for, for whatever reason this week, as I was looking through these, that, that word remain really kind of caught me in this idea of needing to stay close. Because think about it, I'm sure in, in your own life too, every single human, I wish this wasn't true, but the reality is every single human has gone through tragedies. We've gone through difficulties, pains, and hurts, that sometimes at some point even makes it feel like it's going to crush us. And have you noticed what our instinct many times is when we feel that kind of weight and that kind of sorrow? We go to other people. Again, even atheists have this instinct that they need to be with somebody, that there's something about this when we turn to the others, that there's somehow we gain a strength in some weird way, even if turning to our friends, turning to those, even if they're not going to say anything, even if they're not going to change our circumstances in any way, but when we find that person who not only do we cling to, but they cling to us in that moment, there's some really amazing strength that we have. And somehow hope begins to arise in our hearts and our minds even if it's just a small little flicker on that difficult night, but there's something about remaining with others. And certainly humans can get us through for a ways, but it's in fact our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the one who can give us the eternal remaining. So all of this culminates for you and for me today in the great sacrament of the Eucharist. Of course, now we have the gift of knowing the Last Supper. At this point, they didn't know the Last Supper, but you and I know that that's going to happen. So they've heard this phrase, and we'll see that it comes to its peak next week when we read the last part. But what'll happen is, you know, there's a certain trust that Peter and the other apostles are gonna have to have of saying, all right, somehow he's gonna make this happen, and they kind of blindly trust. But I'm sure today's gospel was lingering in their minds when they went to the Last Supper. And what does he do with the bread? Now, remember, the Last Supper was, was a traditional Jewish meal. They, they'd done this before. But Jesus changes something verbally, for he holds up the bread, and he says, this is my body. And he holds up the chalice. And he says, this is my blood. I can only speculate, but it wouldn't shock me if at least one, if not all 12 of them there, their minds snapped back to this moment, to that weird, awkward moment, months, maybe years earlier, when he had said this and they went, oh, this is it. This is the gift of eternal life for us. Here it is now. And the excitement that, even if they didn't understand, even if like in the, in the first reading, they didn't have the wisdom to understand it, there was something that probably got them very excited and they went, this is, this is how it's going to happen. This is how he's going to fulfill it. This is going to be our hope. Did they do it perfectly? No. Were they, were they perfectly attending mass then every day? Not quite. But there it was in this moment, and so too for you and for me. When we come forward for communion, when we receive the very gift of the Eucharist, that is Jesus' fulfillment of what he's offering to you and to me. The eternal bread come down from heaven. The offer of eternal life, because we remain in him through the great reception of communion.
So let us recognize the beautiful, eternal gift that the Eucharist is. Certainly, it's a wonderful ritual that we have, but let us not pass it off as merely a ritual or a routine that we go through, but let us see that it is really, truly the fulfillment for you and for me, for your soul, for my soul, for our longing for eternal life that's written into the fabric of who we are, that that comes to its fulfillment in this great gift of the Eucharist.